And I walk into the living room, and my brother-in-law sees me, and his jaw drops to the floor because I look exactly like my mother. Wow. And uh, my mother was seated on, on the love seat, and I walked over to her, sat down, gave her a big hug, and just whispered in her ear, I want you to know that I'm not mad. And she started crying, and I started crying. Who am I? 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 This is Who Am I Really? A podcast about adoptees that have located and connected with their biological family members. I'm Damon Davis, and on today's show is D.L. He called me from Manhattan, New York. D.L. talks about his youth in a home with a mother addicted to prescription medications who probably wasn't fit to adopt. When he moved out at 18, he climbed his way into the music industry, but his suspicion that his birth mother was alive, contrary to what he was told, never left him. In reunion, his birth mother nearly backed out of meeting him as the guilt of his relinquishment washed over her decades after her decision. Thankfully, DL's sister made sure their reunion and his reunion with his sisters did happen. This is DL's journey. Born in 1952, DL said adoption was just becoming a more popular option for family planning back then. Childless couples were just starting to turn to adoption as an opportunity to make a family, some of them trying desperately to avoid scuttlebutt and derisive gossip from their peers. DL's mother could not conceive, and the people around her were having children or talking about adopting, so his parents adopted him. He grew up in Vineland, New Jersey, in between Atlantic City, New Jersey, and Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. He was the only child in their home. Listen to the way he describes his mother's choice to adopt a child. My mother, uh, I don't think, was really prepared for adoption um, in the first place. She had some... Um, some serious psychological troubles, and she was also cross-addicted to prescription medication, um, namely amphetamines and barbiturates, which made her mood swings uh, violent and sudden. Um, so she really would have been probably better off getting a dog. Mm, interesting. Uh, what does uh, that mean for you as a child who's experiencing these? You, so... You know, as a kid, you don't know that she's cross addicted. You've uh, this sounds like knowledge you've gained as an adult, but what did it feel like? No, for I you? gained it as a, as a adolescent. Is that okay? So, what did, what was it like for you as a kid to experience these these mood swings and the and the her addiction? Well, I was protecting myself a whole lot um, because she would turn on a dime. Um, it would just come out of nowhere, and she would just go sort of uh, mental and uh, start screaming and, and hitting. And uh, it, was, it was, you know, fairly uh, psychologically and somewhat physically abusive. Mm -hmm. And you were told around age eight that you were adopted. What did that, how did that conversation go that t to your recollection? And what did it mean to you for someone to say these, these words? Uh, well, around age eight, you know, I, I realized that I didn't look anything like either of my parents. So I, I went to my mom and I said, you know, what's the deal? Um, and she said, well, uh, you are adopted, which means you're special, in quotation marks. And also, um, your real mother died in childbirth. And, and I'm like, I'm special. And I'm like, what? Uh, so that, you know, all of a sudden, she's telling me that I'm responsible for my mother's demise. Oh, wow. And, and even at eight years old, I can figure out what that meant so uh but all the while she's telling me this i didn't actually believe her or want to believe her i guess i like, didn't know something inside i actually didn't believe her and i wanted to believe that my uh, my birth mother was still alive and uh and i carried that belief with me through my entire adolescence and and early adulthood and my, my whole life um always knowing in somewhere in my heart that she was still alive somewhere, and that I'd find her one day, or that she may be looking for me. Uh, but one day, I knew that we would actually meet. Even as a kid, 
D.L. didn't believe that what he was told was true. But think about it. His mother had been such a volatile person, it wasn't too much to imagine she would make up a story to protect herself and close the issue down with D.L. His sense was she wanted to immediately bring finality to the issue of him acknowledging another mother. His mother was competitive with others, so when the girls next door started taking piano lessons, she enrolled D.L. in piano lessons too with the same teacher. He was an older gentleman who played organ in the church one town over. D.L. took lessons for several months and got very good, but he wasn't reading the music at all. I never learned how to read because I'm severely dyslexic. Mm -hmm. um, but I would make him um, play the next week's lesson for me before he left that day. And I'd practice it all, I'd rehearse it all week the way that I heard it. So I was playing by ear, basically. That's amazing. And he'd come back the next week, and I'd, I'd play him the lesson, and he'd say, he'd say to himself, oh, he made a couple of mistakes, but it, it, it's really very good. Somehow my mother caught on that I wasn't reading, and she fired him. Oh, no. Uh, he came back the next Saturday, um, even though he was fired, and he actually got down on one knee in front of my mother and begged her to let her let him come back and, and teach me again because he thought that I was something of a, I don't know, prodigy or something. Yeah, okay. um, and um, she declined. So um, that was it. So I was basically left to, you know, teach myself. And that's what I did. Since his mother was against paying someone to teach D.L. the piano, he taught himself. He said she was very frugal in some areas, but she would do things like decorate the living room and dining room in French provincial style, making the rooms so nice no one could walk in them. It was, it was like living in a museum. Mm -hmm. um, um, I wasn't allowed to put trash in my own trash bin. I had to walk it into the kitchen. There were all kinds of crazy rules. There, were, there was a bathroom right next to my bedroom with a big tub and everything, and she had put velvet curtains um, over the tub with little, little drawers a draw uh, thing with tassels on the end, mm -hmm. really like super fancy looking. And no one could use that tub. So my father and I and my mother had to use this tiny little bathroom with a sh stall shower that was between their bedroom and the laundry room just off the kitchen. Mm -hmm. So that it was this all sorts of rules and confinement and ways to sort of keep the house looking pristine and basically untouchable. Regarding his father, D.L. said they didn't really have a relationship. His dad was absent, working on the road quite a bit as a salesman. They hardly spoke, and his father only spent quality time with D.L. when his wife told him to. When D.L. was a teenager, he suspected his dad was seeing someone else because he kept coming home later and later, and his mother's condition was spiraling out of control. One day, in his early teens, D.L. got home from school to find he was in the house by himself. He went through the cupboards looking for snacks. And I opened up the wrong cabinet, and there was just vials and vials of drugs. Um, I mean, all kinds of amphetamines. I mean, every amphetamine that you could think of. Wow. Bifetamine T20s, you know, black, black beauties, yellow jackets, uh, escatrols, all kinds of stuff. And then there were there's all kinds of uh, barbiturates. Mimbitol, Secanol, Chilinol. Uh, she even had Quaaludes before I, anybody even knew what they were. Um, she had a, literally a cabinet full. He had a, like a drugstore in her kitchen. Dude. She was spiraling out of control, I think. Even worse, she had all these drugs at her disposal. And she was pretty much, I would imagine, impossible to deal with. I mean, she was for me. So I would imagine that she probably was for him too. And I know they were not having any loving moments so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, pretty sure of that. Um, I think for her, he was really her second or third choice as a husband. So it, it was just all like messed up from the very beginning, basically. Wow. It was just a, just a really messed up relationship and it just continued to get more and more messed up. DL is not the name he grew up with. He adopted that identity apart from the name he was given in adoption. It's an interesting story that I'll let DL explain.
One other thing that I read in the article online was that you grew up with one name and that you changed your name and you split. Can you tell me a little bit about um, what I ultimately want to get to is when you decided that you wanted to search, but I sense that there's an identity <clears throat> change happening for you mm. prior or at the same time. So tell me a little bit about the your transition out of your house or what have you. Okay, well... Uh, there's a little bit of a, a more of a backstory about when I was about eight. Something else that she had mentioned in that conversation when she told me that I was adopted. Um, just sort of as a side note, she said, um, and, and I should have realized that, that and this actually gave credence to my belief that my mother was still alive. Um, she said to me in passing, your mother apparently always wanted your name to be David. So... Interesting. When I was named by them, uh, I was named Gary David. She didn't want to name me David because she didn't want people to call me Dave. And, of course, the first thing people started doing when I was named Gary was to always start calling me Gar. <laughs> so that didn't really work. Um, but I, anyway, when she, she told me that, I should have realized, well, how did she know that, for one? How did she know that my mother wanted me to be named David? Mm-hmm. And I found out later exactly how she did know, but I just resonated with that name. So I just kept that in the back of my head. And um, after I graduated uh, prep school, I, uh, I worked for a few months until early February, and then I moved to New York City on my own pretty much um, on February 14th, 1971, Valentine's Day. I was just 18. So I knew I wanted to get into the music business, but and I, I didn't set about to change my name right away. But as I started to actually get into the music business, um, I eventually figured, okay, now I've w- w- nip it in the bud, do it now. And I started to sort of informally tell my friends and associates, I said, you know, don't call me Gary anymore. My name is David. And by the way, my last name is Byron, because I just liked the idea of, you know, Byron sort of sounded like Dylan to me. I was a big Dylan fan. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was also a fan of of George Gordon Byron as well. I was really into poetry at the time and still am. And I just wanted to be known as David Byron. And when I realized that there was another David Byron who was the lead singer of Uriah Heep, Mm -hmm. um, I realized I needed the middle name. And... um, the first job that I had in New York City was working at Colony Records, which was a really big record store on Broadway. I only worked there about nine months and then, until I got a, my first staff writer's job. But I worked with this guy named Lee Lanzett, and he spelled it L-E-I-G-H, which is sort of the Anglican way of spelling it. Mm-hmm. So I thought back, I said, oh, Lee, yeah, that's cool. I'll be David Lee Byron, and that'll make me D.L. Byron. Oh, that's even cooler. <laughs> that's awesome. So, so that's what I went with. That's really and eventually, cool. I just became D.L. Byron. D.L. said the manager of the first publisher who signed him into the music business was a wonderful woman whom he had shared his adoption story with. She offered to help him find his biological mother by connecting him with adoption agencies, but not knowing his birth mother's last name presented a challenge. And there were no commercial DNA testing options back then like there are now, so he was hitting lots of brick walls. After a few years, D.L. returned to Catholic Charities in South Jersey. At the time, they were maintaining sealed records, not assisting anyone with reunification services. He pretty much gave up on his search. Years later, he decided to reach out to Catholic Charities again. He was in his late 30s, married, and the environment for reunification had changed dramatically. Catholic Charities had done a 180 and offered D.L. a caseworker named Betty. She was a semi-retired older woman who worked part-time. The pair chatted every couple of months about his case, updating D.L. about the family trees she had investigated. D.L. caught word that Betty had been transferred from Camden, New Jersey, to Vineland, D.L.'s hometown, just one hour from the Jersey Shore. He called her office to see if they could connect face-to-face since they had been speaking by phone for two years. Unfortunately, Betty the social worker, who was an avid golfer, had suffered a broken ankle and was out for eight weeks. When D.L. called back, eight weeks later, he left a message for Betty. 
She called him back the next day. So I'm back in New York City at the time. And I had been up all night writing, writing something, working on something. And it was about 11 in the morning. My wife had gone to work. And the phone rings. And it's Betty. It's her. And she said, uh, I said, hi, how are you? She said, hi, hi. Get a pen, get a pad, and, and, and listen to me and write all this stuff down. Wow. And I want you to promise never, ever to tell anybody about what I'm doing right now because I'm going out of the confines of my job. And I love my job. I don't want to lose my job. But get a pen and pad and, and listen to me. And I said, okay, okay. So I, I, I did all that. And I'm, I'm going, okay, go ahead. And then she started telling me stuff. Your mother's name is Jean. She gave me her whole, like, her, her whole name, last name as well, her birth date, a bunch of other information. And she said, you have, she have, you have a sister who, uh, whose name she gave me, who is an attorney in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. And here's her work number. And I said, that's it? She said, that's it. And if, and if something worse had happened to me than just breaking my ankle, no one would have ever, ever picked up your file. So please don't tell anybody about this. I really don't want to lose much. I said, I promise, I promise. DL realized in that moment he had the toughest cold call he might ever have to make in his life. Feeling shaken by the whole thing, he called his wife at work and asked her to come home. Strategizing how to get through to his biological sister at her office, he developed a ruse that he was an informant on a legal case that she might be working on. When the office receptionist answered the phone, D.L. asked to speak with his sister Diane. When she asked who was calling, he told the receptionist he would like to remain anonymous as an informant, and it worked. Next thing I know, here, hello, this is Diane. I'm like, oh, man. Uh, <laughs> hi, Diane. My name is David Byron. Uh, hello, David. Uh, uh, yeah. Is your mother's name Jean? Yes. Was she born on such and such a date, uh, 1930s? Yes. And then she said, who is this? And I said, I have every reason to believe that I'm your brother. And then came that sort of pregnant pause where she would either hang up or say something like, well, we know about you and, and we don't want to, anything to do with you or whatever. And she was silent for a while. And then she said, go on. <laughs> I just wow. started, then I started to just babble, you know, I just started to like run up the mouth <laughs> and we talked for about 45 minutes. She gave me her home number. She said, call me tonight. I'm thinking, oh, wow, this is a lot better than I expected. So I called her that night. We spoke for about an hour. I called her the next night, another hour again. And um, she said to me in, in one of those conversations, she said, you know, I always suspected that my mother had sort of a skeleton in the closet but I could never, ever figure out what it was. But I always knew there was like a, a big family secret. On Tuesday of that week, after a few conversations between them, D.L. got the courage to ask Diane if she wanted to meet up. He was planning to be at his beach house that weekend, and Diane was in Cherry Hill, New Jersey, not too far away. Diane said she'd like to think about it. She decided she was going to go to their mother's house the next night carry some family photos with her, and see if she could flush out the story that her mother kept hidden inside her. Diane and her mother sat down for dinner and discussed the old family photos they each had brought out to share. She opened up to one page of, of my, my mother's book, and there was a picture of my mother as a young girl with all these other young girls standing in front of this big white sort of building um, out in sort of like the Pine Barrens, somewhere out in the woods, with two nuns on either side of these, this group of girls. Uh, so my, my sister said, uh, where's this? And my mother said, oh, this is the place my mother used to send me when she thought she couldn't take care of me. And then my mother went up and got, got into the bathroom. And as she did that, my sister took the, uh, the photograph out of the, the sleeve of the, the photo album, and it said Freehold, New Jersey on the back. I was born in Trenton, apparently. That, that's what it says in my record of birth. Mm -hmm. Freehold is like almost right next to Trenton. So, um, and that was something that I had said to, to my sister Diane in the earlier conversations. I think I was born in Trenton or maybe somewhere near there. So that's sort of justified in her head. 
so she came out, my mother came out of the bathroom and sat down and, and Diane said, um, you know, Mom, I've got this guy who's been calling me and he claims to be my brother. And apparently she sat back in her chair and, and got a little weepy and she said, uh, well, he probably is. And that was it for her. Uh, she, she had, you know, she totally believed the, the whole scenario. And uh, we spoke the next day. And I said, please, you know, drive her down Saturday and, and we'll all meet. You and your husband, who's also an attorney, um, we'll all meet and, you know, have lunch or something. So um, Saturday rolled around and um, she went to pick up her mom and her mom all of a sudden was going back out because she was crying and she was saying that she wasn't worthy and she was suffering terrible, terrible guilt mm. for having given me up. Yeah. Um, Somehow Diane talked her into actually going through with it and getting into the car. And they're driving down. And uh, my brother-in-law, who also, I said is also an attorney, all the way down is who's driving, is saying, this guy's up to no good. I smell something bad. He wants, he's after our money. He's, he's, you know, he's not real. And um, they get to our house. And uh, my wife lets them in. I'm just getting out of the shower. My hair's still wet. And I walk into the living room, and my brother-in-law sees me, and his jaw drops to the floor because I look exactly like my mother. Wow. And uh, my mother was seated on, on the love seat, and I walked over to her, sat down, gave her a big hug, and just whispered in her ear, I want you to know that I'm not mad. And she started crying, and I started crying, and, and that was it. We had lunch. Uh, we played some board games. I played some songs for them on guitar. We walked to the beach. They said they were going to go. I said, no, let's go, have, let's go get a bite for dinner. And we went and we had dinner together. They stayed all day into the evening. During their conversations before the reunion, Diane shared that D.L. had seven sisters. Of course, he was astonished to learn that he had so many siblings. During the reunion with his mother and sister, D.L. wanted to share some pictures of himself, but he didn't have any recent photos only the cover photos from a recent CD he had just put out. He brought a stack of CDs out for his mother to share with her daughters. The next morning, D.L.'s birth mother called a big family meeting at Diane's house where all of the sisters showed up. She basically put my CD in front of all of them at the dining room table, and my eldest sister, Donna, said, Boy, why are you giving me a CD? I don't have a CD player. And at the same time, one of the uh, younger little kids walked by and goes, Oh, look, that guy looks just like Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So, so um, that's when they all found out that, you know, this had happened and she had kept this a secret all these years. And then Diane called me. It was maybe 10 in the morning. The phone rang in Ocean City. And she said, well, uh, they all know and they all want to meet you. Do you feel like driving to Cherry Hill? And I said, uh, I'll be there in an hour. Of course, I couldn't drive. I, I was, like, way too nervous. So mm. my wife, Leslie, had to drive. But um, we pulled up to Diane's house. Uh, my, my eldest sister, Donna, the one who didn't have the CD player, was standing in the road crying. Oh. I mean, as we pulled up to the... I mean, I don't know how... She was, like, waiting for me, I guess, in the street. <laughs> and uh, once I got there, the door, the front door of the house opened, and all my sisters started, like, sort of piling out of the house, you know, arms waving and flailing. And, and we all like just came together as a group and hugged and kissed and, you know, introduced each other and then laughed and then hugged and kissed some more. And eventually we all went into the house and, and sort of this sort of the process of getting to know each other. Um, it was, uh, it lasted for hours that day. And, and it was an amazing, it was an amazing, amazing day. I can only imagine. Incredible. You went yeah. from being an only to having seven seven siblings. That's right. just unreal. Yeah. Wow. What did you see yeah. in your mother when you saw her for the first time? Because everybody else can see your face on her 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 face on you. What right. What did you see? Um, I I I saw I saw the resemblance. Uh, of course, I had a million questions for her not all of which she could answer, like who was my father. And apparently my, my father was like a one-night stand, mm -hmm. and all she could remember about the guy was that he was 
uh, northern Italian, and she thought he had uh, moved to California and never never saw him again. And he never knew that you know she was pregnant. She told me that she, her, that she herself was born out of wedlock, and that the guy who sired her, the man who sired her, um, was the guy who owned the music store in Vineland, which is where I bought my first guitar. Shut up. Are you no. serious? So I bought my first guitar from my biological grandfather. Oh my God, that is crazy. Yeah. Wow. Well, it's all in the book. <laughs> That's unbelievable, man. I just got to chill. Like, that is really unbelievable. Yeah, there's more. But, you know, um, the book is full of stuff like this. Mm hmm. Um, yeah. It's, it's a whole lot of coincidence, coincidence and, and, and weird. Where it's up. His autobiography is called Shadows of the Night, named after a song DL wrote in the early 1980s for Grammy award-winning artist Pat Benatar. He decided to write his book after his birth mother passed away in 2015. He says his story was just too incredible not to write down, so he took the time to document his journey. I asked DL to tell me a little bit about his book and what he wanted people to get from reading his story. Basically, it's a book about never giving up because I never gave up on myself being able to give my gift of music and I never gave up on finding my mother. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, you know, I hope that people, when they read it, they find it, inspirational because it's it's more than just about you know being signed by Clive Davis and, and all these you know famous people in the music business and all the stuff that I did and, and you know the adventures and misadventures and, and achievements and, and you know downfalls and you know it's 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 more than all that. It's it's a life lesson. And uh, that's what I'm hoping people will take away from it. D.L. said that songwriting is very different than book writing, and it wasn't until he got really into documenting his story that he realized how challenging it can be to piece together his rich life of what I can imagine are fascinating stories. It took him three years to put it all together. Looking at his paternal history, I asked him if he had tried to find his biological father. No, I haven't, and I haven't even tried to go up my grandfather's Tree, which would be easy for me to do because they're all in my hometown. Um, I, I figure at this point, I've already hit the lottery, you know. Um, that's enough. Mm -hmm. I don't have to mess up anybody else's life. By, <laughs> you know, showing up at somebody's door and saying, hey, you know, we're related. You know, um, I, I, I just, I figure this, you know, it's, I, I got what, just what I needed. D.L. says his relationship with his sisters is good. They came together and got really close, and he feels like their reunion really brought everyone together. Of course, there are some of the classic challenges that happen with disagreements between siblings, and there are some rifts. But those issues don't have anything to do with D.L.'s emergence. It's just family drama that we all have to deal with. I asked about D.L.'s adopted mother and whether he kept in touch with her at all, and whether he had shared any element of his journey with her. D.L. closes with that story and one of the highlights of his career as the writer of a Grammy award-winning song. No, she, she passed away the uh, September after I moved to New York. So she passed away just a few months after I, I moved to New York City. Is that right? Wow. My yeah, gosh. she died of a massive... Uh, heart attack. Um, mm. Well, if you take enough vitamins, that's probably what's going to happen. Mm -hmm, to you. Sure. But uh, she, yeah, she just like her heart exploded pretty much. Oh my gosh, that's yeah. unbelievable! Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, what an amazing story! This is incredible. The book is called Shadows of the Night. Uh, right. I'm so after the song. Yeah, I'm gonna. I'm gonna seek out the song i listened to it a long time ago when uh when i first got your application but i'm going to seek out the song again because i want to listen to your work and and pat benatar's expression of it it sounds like it's so cool <laughs>
Wow. Well, it won her a Grammy. That was, so that was pretty good. Yeah, a Grammy award. I mean, that's that's a super career highlight, man. Well, well done. That's so awesome. Yeah. Good for you. I don't know. A total sidebar, but my wife is. Uh, she works for the Recording Industry Association, the RIAA, who certify gold mm-hmm. and platinum sales. And uh, one of her great career benefits is attending the Grammys on an annual basis. So we will be oh, out there. Great. I don't know if you go anymore, but we'll be out there. It'd be cool to shake your hand if you're in town. Uh, well, you know, a funny story before you go. Sure. Uh, when Shadows was released. It was all over the radio, and, and it was like climbing the charts. I think it was already top five. And uh, I called my attorney, and I said, you know, the Grammys are coming up. Is it, is it nominated? And he goes, no, I don't think so. I haven't heard anything. And I started calling up other people that I knew in the industry, and like, they no, I haven't heard anything. So uh, I said to my girlfriend at the time, I was really kind of pissed. <laughs> yeah. And I said, uh, you know, I'm not going to watch the Grammys this year. Let's just go out for dinner. And she goes, no, no, you, it's your industry. You have to watch the Grammys. Let's stay home and watch it. I said, all right. So we ordered in Chinese food, and we sat there and watched them. And then her category came up. It was Best Female Rock Vocal for 1982, I think it was. And um, all of a sudden, she won. And they pan, the camera pans to an empty seat. And the, the MC said, uh, uh, Miss Benatar is, is on the road. Uh, she won't be able to actually accept in person. I'm going, are you kidding me? Oh my I could have flown to L.A. and accepted the award as the writer, and and I made her, you know, chase me down for for the for the freaking trophy. <laughs> oh my gosh, are you serious? Yeah, that is. I'm, I was like screaming at the TV, standing there. <laughs> oh my god, that's <laughs> unreal, unreal. Yeah, so uh, so anyway, I'll leave it on that on that note. Oh, David, that's too bad, man. That's a moment lost. <laughs> I'm so sorry to hear no, that. No, it's okay. That's it's really all right. cool. Well, thank you so much for taking time to share your story, man. I really appreciate it. And I hope that people will find inspiration in the perseverance that you've expressed in your story. The book, Shadows of the Night, DL, thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate it. All the best to you. Okay. No problem, Damon. Thank Take you. Take care. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Hey, it's me. DL's story of overcoming severe dyslexia and a cross-addicted mother to achieve musical notoriety is really amazing. While it must have been tough to be in New York on his own at 18, his perseverance to reach back to Catholic charities throughout the years and finally get detailed information from Betty was awesome. I love to hear about people doing the right thing for someone else when no one else is looking, and that's exactly what Betty did for DL. I don't know about you, but I could totally imagine the scene where his birth mother spread the CDs out on the kitchen table when DL's nephew passed by and recognized his face as the same as his grandma's. Kids, they're the best. Like I said, DL's book is called Shadows of the Night, named for the song you're hearing. Take some time to check out his or some other adoptee autobiographies online or at a retailer near you. I'm Damon Davis, and I hope you'll find something in DL's journey that inspires you, validates your feelings about wanting to search, or motivates you to have the strength along your journey to learn. Who am I, really? The hungry hunter, he makes his laws with the barrel of a gun. We're running through the shadows of the night So come and take my hand, we'll be alright And if I have to stand and brave the fight I will win in the end If you would like to share your adoption journey and your attempt to connect with your biological family, please visit whoamireallypodcast.com slash share. You can follow the show at facebook.com slash really or Follow on Twitter at WAI Really. If the show is meaningful to you, you can support me with a contribution to keep it going on patreon.com slash WAI Really. Please subscribe to Who Am I Really on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. It would mean so much to me if you took a moment to leave a five-star rating there. Those ratings can help others to find the podcast too. And if you're interested you can check out the story of my adoption journey, Who Am I Really? An Adoptee Memoir, 
on Amazon.com, on Kindle, or as an audiobook on Audible. I hope you'll add my story to your reading list. You know you gotta make a stand sometime It takes guts to live in this world We're running through the shadows of the night So come and take my hand, we'll be alright And if I have to stand and brave the fight I will win in the end We're running through the shadows of the night So come and take my hand, we'll be alright if I have to stand and breathe the fight, I will win in the end. Thanks very much.